Good morning. We want to welcome everyone joining us this morning here at Bridgewater Baptist Church. Our services today are being broadcast over our local radio signal 98.7 FM here in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia, as well as over our YouTube and Facebook channels. You can learn more about the ministries of our church by visiting www.bridgewaterbaptist.com and you can access our weekly bulletin there. Um, if you'd like to receive special updates and the weekly bulletin, you can just use the subscribe button on the website or just reach out to us at the church office at 902-543-2178. Just a reminder that next Sunday, May the 30th, we at Bridgewater Baptist Church will be celebrating our 173rd anniversary. And we are just really excited, even though we're not in the church building and we're not here in person, we still have reason to celebrate. And uh, Debbie Zwicker, our music director, is right now combing through the archives of our music and will be picking out some special um, songs and, and treats for us to listen to next Sunday. So we do hope that you will join us. And as we start our worship service this morning, let's begin with our call to worship. This morning's call to worship comes from Psalm 100. Let's read this together. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen.
And when I 
don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you Welcome once again to everyone joining us today online and those listening over 98.7 FM here in Bridgewater and area. My name is Aaron Kenny and I'm the lead pastor here. And today you're joining us in part seven, our final part in this series, So Glad That You Asked. And we are so grateful for all the people in the church congregation here, but also in the wider community who've been sending in questions over these last seven weeks. Uh, today we're going to look at four questions, but we have a lot more left. and so. My guess is that sometime later in the year, we'll circle back and revisit some of the questions we didn't have a chance to look at. The other thing I want to mention is that some of the questions that came in were big questions. They're the, they're the kind of questions that really deserve their own series. And so if you've asked some big questions and we haven't responded yet, don't worry. We haven't uh, forgot those questions and we may give them a little more attention than, uh, than just giving a few minutes in one of these messages. So with that said, let's jump into our first question today. And all four of the questions today kind of circle out from different perspectives. A bigger question, who is God? Our first question actually flows out of a larger question about God and Charles Darwin. This person asks, it seems that modern society either makes religion conform to where it is and wants to go, and not the antithesis of acknowledging the truth of the Bible to be the guiding force. Quite possibly what Darwin presented, and in that science is the pursuit of truth, has muddied the waters and left us challenged rather than accepting. I always had trouble with biology and religion mixing. What do you think? And along those same lines, someone else wrote in and asked, is the book of Genesis true? Is it real history? Does it really ever tell us how the world and the universe were made? Wow, thanks so much for this question. This is a great example of one of those questions that deserves for us to circle back and follow this thread deeper because it's gonna to lead to a lot more questions. So thank you so much for asking. If I was to just to give a very short answer right off the top, I would say, yes, um, the book of Genesis is all true and some of it may have actually happened. When someone asks about history, they're really asking about genre, uh, the type of literature. And the Bible is a library. It is a collection of all sorts of sacred writings composed in many different periods in history with many different literary genres. The Bible has historical narratives, but it also contains poetry and prophecy and wisdom literature and just several other genres, gospels, apocalyptic. Genesis is not written like a modern history textbook. It is not a history in the modern sense. Um, but it does talk about events, and it talks about the meaning behind where we came from in the world. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 both do this as Hebrew poetry. Uh, in different perspectives, Genesis 1 and then to Genesis 2, comes at the same question of origins of why God has brought this world into existence. 
Who is this God? Who are we as his creation? All of this is looked at in this figurative language and metaphor and beauty of Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2. And they will lay down as a foundation ideas and themes and motifs that will go through all of the scriptures. Uh, again and again, we'll see echoes and reflections of Genesis 1 and 2 popping up throughout the Old and the New Testament. It is profoundly true and important what we find here, not only in Genesis 1 and 2, but through the whole book of Genesis. One example when I say that Genesis 1 and 2 is filled with figurative language uh, is the use of the word days. Uh, if you were to come at Genesis 1 and 2 um, and try to read it um, literally, you might get a little confused because the word days, which appears on the first day God created, the second day, all through the seven days, well, it's not until day four that God actually creates the sun and the moon and the stars. And so whatever the first three days are, they're really nothing like the kind of days that we understand when we use the word days. Again, this is just an example of how the, wor the words of Genesis are figurative language. They're, they're pointing to deeper and more significant realities. And we need to be careful that we just don't read it, read it literally, but we read it literarily. That we understand the genre and what's going on in the way that those original authors were moved by God's Holy Spirit to put down these words which we view as scripture, God's revealed word. So all of Genesis is a type of Hebrew poetry, and it's filled with truth, but it's not addressing scientific questions. <clears throat> it's not like a history book or a biology textbook or a geological treatise. The Bible is filled with theological reflection that looks at who humanity is, what is our purpose, and what's our relationship with God. Throughout the book of Genesis, the Israelite writers try to package truth claims in this narrative poetry interspersed with genealogies. But one of the problems for us as English readers is that if we pick up a Bible and we start reading, we recognize the words because they're English words in our translations. But they often point to meanings far beyond what we bring to those words. Um, they carry a deeper understanding of the cosmology and the worldview and the perspectives of these ancient writers. And so you can't come to the Bible and just read it the way you would read a Facebook post or the way you might pick up a newspaper. Now the Bible is meant to be studied and meditated on. That's what Psalm 1 is all about, that we would live our lives going back again and again and again to the scriptures, chewing on and meditating, praying through these words. And as we do, we will be like a tree with its, its roots going down into a living stream of water becoming stronger, full of life and vitality. That's what the Bible is supposed to be. It's supposed to be literature that draws us closer to God and into the reality of what God's doing, his great story. And somehow we get to be a part of that story. That's why we meditate on God's word. That's why we memorize it and study it. And it becomes a part of our liturgies and our services as Christians all around the world worship the one living God. Now, we appreciate that the library of books in the Bible are ancient. They were not written to us, but they were written for us. And so in order to really understand what's going on in the biblical text, it's important for us to take our time to try to understand the context and what's going on in the time of these writers and how these words, say in Genesis, connect with the other words in the Bible, how these stories connect with the greater story, and ultimately how they connect with the revelation of Jesus. Because as we've shared throughout this series, we understand the Bible through Jesus. It is from faith to faith that we come to God's word. So reading the Bible well requires us to connect with the deeper ideas, the deeper things going on in the text. Another great example of this is the word earth. When you hear the word earth, what do you see? Take a minute, just close your eyes. Earth, what are you picturing? Like most people in the year uh, 2021, you're probably picturing a blue sphere, you know, a planet in the blackness of space with the green continents and, and white clouds maybe swirling around. That image of planet Earth is something that is just common to all of us. It's, it's a part of our cosmology. But that wasn't true of the ancient writers of Genesis 
or really anyone who is a writer, an author, within the biblical uh, narratives. No, it's not that, that the world wasn't a planet back then, it's they were completely oblivious of it. And so when those writers in Genesis, for example, use the word Earth, they're not thinking planet, they're not thinking solar system, they're thinking of the ground beneath their feet, they're thinking of the Earth beneath them. And that's connected with the whole layers of story and understanding from their time that's very distant from us. Words connect to stories. Here's another example. If I was to tell you that my uncle is a Nimrod, what would it mean? Seriously, what would it mean if you heard someone else being referred to as a Nimrod? Take a second, maybe if you're with people, uh, you're sitting with watching this service, back and forth. What does the word Nimrod mean? Or maybe you're on your own right now, uh, why don't you text? Put it in the text right there on Facebook or on YouTube. Let us know, what do you think of when you hear the word Nimrod? What comes to mind? Dimwit? Fool? Jerk? Idiot? <laughs> yeah, all of those words, certainly, and more, uh, are often something that we would connect with in our time when we heard, hear the word Nimrod. And so if you heard me referring to an uncle being a Nimrod, you might assume I was insulting him. But if I ask that question to your grandparents, or anyone who lived pre-1945, they would not have that association. Now they might look at you and say, who are you talking about, or what are you talking about, what's a Nimrod? But for many people, especially those who grew up in the church, they might say, oh, you mean a great or mighty hunter. Because pre-1945, if someone recognized the reference to Nimrod, that's exactly what they thought. A Nimrod, as we see in the book of Genesis, is the first hunter after the Garden of Eden, when all these big wild animals are roaming the earth, and people are terrified of them. But he is known as a mighty hunter. Now, why is it that you, would, you and me, to be honest, would associate Nimrod with so many derogatory words? Well, the answer is Bugs Bunny. When the Bugs Bunny cartoons first came out in 1945, they introduced the world to this sarcastic rabbit and his angry friend Daffy Duck, and they were continually evading this hapless hunter named Elmer Fudd. And in those first cartoons, in fact, the very first one called A Wild Hare, this wise-cracking bunny calls Elmer Fudd, his nemesis, poor little Nimrod. Daffy Duck will also call him Nimrod later in the cartoons. And so for the children back in 1945 and the many children to come afterwards, as they heard the word Nimrod, they probably didn't get the reference. They probably didn't realize that Daffy Duck and uh, Bugs Bunny were being sarcastic. Calling Elmer Fudd Nimrod, the mighty warrior, the mighty hunter, would be like calling someone who's really tall, Shorty, or calling Mike Dory, who sings in our worship team, Pee Wee. It's sarcastic. It's like the complete opposite of who they are. And so um, there in the, the Bugs Bunny cartoons, in popular culture in North America, the word Nimrod takes on this derogatory sense. And this is continually happening. Centuries ago, if I was to tell you that I'm going to buy Clue for my kids, people would probably assume that I was going to buy them a ball of yarn, because that's what a Clue was. But today, when, if you heard me say I'm buying Clue for my kids, you'd assume I was buying them a board game with a whodunit with deductive reasoning. Uh, in Old English, Chaucer refers to a girl, and during his day, girl didn't refer to a female. Girl referred to any young person of either sex. A girl just meant a child. These are examples not just about translation, but about the deeper concepts and worldviews of people in cultures and in history. So just because the book of Genesis doesn't fit into our modern category of history or science doesn't make it any the less true. In fact, great Christian thinkers from Augustine to Bonhoeffer to C.S. Lewis did not consider the truth of Genesis to be confined to a superficial record of events. Now Genesis helps us to wrestle with deeper questions of meaning, the experience of wonder, and the hope found in centering our life on a relationship with this loving creator and sustainer in God's good world. Genesis tells us that to be truly human 
is to bear God's image in the world and to reflect back to God and to others the love that we have received. To read and to meditate on Genesis, we discover our own stories, our own sense of innocence lost, of failure, of hope, and of redemption, ultimately in Jesus, who fulfills prophecies embedded right there in the beginning of Genesis. The danger is that we can easily read into these pages what's not there. We can bring our Elmer Fudd understandings, our own insecurities, our own culture, and it can blind us to so much truth that's right there in the scriptures. This is why I think we need to read the Bible as a part of a worshiping community, as a part of a tradition that can come to the Bible with both confidence of faith and humility. As followers of Jesus, I believe that faith and science go hand in hand, and that the more we learn about biology and physics and the universe, the more we learn about God's creativity. It strengthens what we see in scriptures, that our God has been fine-tuning all the details of the universe, and that the reality around us isn't the product of blind chance, but it points to a designer with intention and with love. Our next question. I've always been so uncomfortable with people who would say that I am religious. In fact, I generally get defensive and say, I'm not religious, I'm a Christian. I have faith in Christ. I have a friend who would say, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. My question, perhaps, is how can I respond to accusations that I'm religious? Because it's usually from people referring to religious fanatics, or lately, as a response to churches not obeying the COVID regulations. Thank you so much for this question. I imagine that a lot of people who are listening today know exactly what you're talking about. There are a lot of strange and awful things done in the name of Christianity that I also want to distance myself from because it is so far from who Jesus is and what he teaches. The person who asked this question actually quoted a post Aaron shared from Reverend Barbara Brown Taylor who wrote about the tensions and the divisions among Christians in the United States over the past number of years. And she says, the only clear line I draw these days is this, when my religion tries to come between me and my neighbor, I will choose my neighbor. Jesus never commanded me to love my religion. People use the word religion in a lot of different ways. It's like the word trunks. Trunks can make, mean a large case. It can mean the central stem of trees. It can mean the large nose of an elephant. And it can even mean the bottom of your bathing suit. The word religion can mean a lot of different things. For some people, religion is associated with rules and legalism. For others, the word is associated with spirituality and mystery. For others, it's a word that's about tradition or history. We can smuggle a lot of ideas into a conversation when we use a word like religion. And the Bible warns us not to quarrel about words. Paul talks about this in his letters to Timothy when he says, Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. In one sense, religion is any organized system of faith. And so if someone says Christianity is a religion, then technically that's true. But I think many of us know that being a Christian means so much more than that. More than a mere religion, being a Christian means having a relationship with Jesus. This past week, Christians around the world celebrated the day of ascension, when Jesus ascended 40 days after his resurrection. The ascension does not simply mean that he left earth and is waiting in heaven. The ascension is about Jesus ruling, and it's a reminder that he'll one day return again. To be a Christian is to be a follower of the living Jesus. We seek to follow his example and to be led by his spirit within our lives. To say that Jesus hates religion is not true. What the gospel teaches us is that Jesus hates religious hypocrisy and self-righteousness. Jesus says that religious rules are made for the love of people and not the other way around. 
If I'm talking to someone who is angry or hurt over religion or over the church, I don't want to be defensive. I want to listen and I want to hear their story. And honestly, it may surprise them to know that we agree about the same things, many of the same things. I'm not interested in the sort of religion that breeds war and violence, because Jesus breeds love. I'm troubled by religion that is ruled by fear and by punishment, because Jesus is about love and he's about mercy. Jesus says, love your neighbor, love people, love your enemy. But that doesn't mean that Jesus is anti-religious. First of all, Jesus was a Jew. He went to services at the synagogue. He went to pray and worship in the temple. He observed Jewish holy days. He ate kosher. In fact, he even told his disciples, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. When Christians gather together to worship and to pray, to give to the poor, to serve their neighbors, and listen to scripture being read and taught, this looks very religious to people. Because technically, it is. But that's okay. Jesus instituted the ritual meal that we celebrate together in communion. Jesus told his disciples to baptize, baptize people and to teach others to obey everything he commanded. And Jesus says, if anyone loves me, they will keep my word. So if someone wants to give you a hard time because they want to say, if you're a Christian, you must be religious, like all of the extreme examples that make you feel uncomfortable, it's an opportunity for you to challenge that stereotype. Ask what it is they feel offended by when they, say, when they use the word like religious. Don't let them off with throwing some cheap label on you. Have a conversation and you don't need to be defensive. In fact, they may discover that you're just as offended by the misbehavior they see as so-called religious as they are. And they may discover that your faith is not in a system, but it's in a relationship with the Savior. If religion means you must obey to be accepted, you can let them know that as followers of Jesus, we obey because we are already accepted. Obedience and serving others is not something we do to earn God's love, but it's an expression of our love for God. When the apostles like James talk about religion in the Bible, they don't reduce it to a simple system of belief. True religion, we read, puts that relationship with Jesus into action, caring for the needs of the vulnerable and the distressed, loving others, and living out our faith in the world. This third question is for Pastor Paula, who will be sharing a response from her home. The question is this, who is God? What do we mean when we talk about God being Trinity? The question has been asked, who is God? In John chapter 14, verse 16, where Jesus is talking here, and he is talking about the word you might have heard, the Trinity. We believe there's one God, but there's three persons. So Jesus is saying here, I will ask the Father, that's the Creator, and He will give you another Counselor to be with you forever. He also says in verse 26, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So the Trinity is a hard concept, but as I ex was explaining to my grandchildren, we believe there's one God, but there's three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And each one of those persons has a different role, being God. Just like myself, I'm one person, but my roles are different as a wife to my husband, as a grandmother to my grandchildren, and as a mother to my own children. So one God, but three different roles, three different persons. So I hope that this is helpful. Um, in answering in a little bit the answer to the question is who is God? Our final question for today is this. I've heard that Sophia is the Holy Spirit. Is that true? What is our Baptist understanding of the Holy Trinity? Next week we're going to be talking even more about the doctrine of the Trinity as we celebrate Trinity Sunday as part of our 173rd uh, anniversary service here at Bridgewater. As Pastor Paula has shared, the Trinity is central to our understanding of God as revealed in Scripture. 
Today I want to respond to this reference to Sophia, which is one of the prominent feminine representations of God in the Hebrew scriptures. She is the personification of divine wisdom. The term is not found in the New Testament, but Paul does refer to divine wisdom in his letters to the Corinthians, telling us that divine wisdom is a mystery that existed before creation. Early Christian fathers referred to Jesus as divine wisdom. And this led to a great deal of Christian, Christian mysticism at the idea of the sacred feminine. The question that Pastor Erica read is actually part of a much larger question that this individual sent in. And he references a book by Bruce Sanguin called Darwin, Divinity, and the Dance of the Cosmos, an Ecological Christianity. I don't really have time to give this book justice today, uh, but it has some great big ideas inside of it. Um, I do want to look, though, at this question of Christian ecology at another time. So we won't look at it today, but we will look at ecology in the future. So Sophia and who is God? We see in scripture that God is neither male nor female, but God is not less than male or female. Genesis is very direct about the fact that we are made male and female in God's image. Then God said, let us make man or humanity in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. And then later in Genesis chapter 3, And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us. Throughout the scriptures, God is described both in masculine and in feminine terms. In Deuteronomy, we read that God gave birth to Israel. And the Bible is filled with other feminine descriptions of God as well. The prophet Isaiah describes God as a woman in labor and as a mother comforting her children. This is also done by the prophet Hosea and by the psalmists. And God describes himself without gender. I am who I am. Even Jesus describes himself as a mother bird wanting to wrap Jerusalem under her wings like her chicks. But the most robust feminine description of God I think in the Bible, comes here in the book of Proverbs, this feminine figure called Lady Wisdom, or Sophia. Sophia accompanies God in the creation of the world and infuses the creation with moral wisdom. She is the personification of the Spirit of God. Now, Solomon, who we talked a lot about last week, uh, as a bit of a cautionary tale, he is a man who seeks after wisdom. Now, he will fail to use it, and his actions will unravel the very peace and uh, destroy the, uh, the United Kingdom of Israel. He kind of is a bit of a train wreck. But in the beginning of uh, his story, there in 1 Kings chapter 3, he has an opportunity to come before God and ask for a gift. And he asks for wisdom. And later we will see in 1 Kings that Solomon will go out and he will collect wisdom. He will write down thousands of proverbs and wise sayings and poems, and he will gather the wisdom from other kings and other nations that are around him. The book of Proverbs that we have in our Bible is a collection often attributed to Solomon, though not all of the Proverbs and even all the chapters in the book of Proverbs come from Solomon. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So when many of us think of Proverbs, we probably are thinking of those little pithy sayings, you know, those kind of one-liners or two-liners that maybe you memorized some when you were a child. But there's so much more to the book of Proverbs than those pithy one-liners. Proverbs actually begins after the introduction with, with these characters. And the first character is a father, a father who is sitting down with his son. And the father wants to impart wisdom to his son. Now, this is not prophecy or law but practical wisdom, lived knowledge, uh, how to apply morality to life so that you will live your life well. The father wants his son to experience the good and the wise way of living. Now the second person we encounter there in the beginning of Proverbs is Lady Wisdom, or in Greek, Sophia. She is woven into the fabric of the universe, and from her we 
draw all wisdom. We live in God's good world. It is a moral universe, and to live well in it, it, requ it requires us to have integrity, to be generous, to uphold justice and mercy. Then there's these anti-characters, this Lady Folly, who represents the opposite of Lady Wisdom. She shows a path of the simple and the fool who will disregard Lady Wisdom, Sophia, at their own peril. And at the end of Proverbs, we'll have these outsiders, Agur and Lemuel. Lemuel is a king from another nation, and he talks about his mother, the wisdom he receives from his mother. And interestingly, as Proverbs begins with a father giving wisdom to his son, Proverbs ends with a mother giving wisdom to her son. And this boy, this king, who re reflects on being a boy, talks about the wisdom given by his mother, about what does it mean to be a godly woman. So chapter 31 tells us, or shows us, what does it look like to live out the Proverbs, to live a wise life. Sophia is an expression of God's wisdom and how we join God in God's creation and his redemptive work in the world. And to call it a dance, like Bruce uh, Sanguin does, I think is a beautiful metaphor. Because for the early Jewish and Christian tradition, this was a dance, and this understanding that we are moving in step with what God is doing through time and space. And so yes, I think when we th talk about the Trinity, we don't imagine three men you know, sitting together, jamming on their harps in heaven. When we talk about the Trinity, we're talking about one God and three persons interacting and giving and receiving, and together they will shape and they will sustain life, and they will enter the story of creation in beautiful and complex ways. So I appreciate how Lady Wisdom gives us another perspective on God, this God who is beyond masculine and beyond feminine, but not less than either. Of course, there's a word of caution here, and that's that when we think about wisdom, or Sophia in the Greek, we are not talking about a fourth member of the Trinity. There are some Gnostic traditions that have tried to do that, to make um, Lady Wisdom a god or a goddess, uh, either a part of the Trinity or a separate god or goddess on her own. We are not given that in the Christian scriptures at all. Lady Wisdom, like the Father in the beginning of Proverbs, directs us to the Son, to the life of following the guidance and the truth that comes from our Lord. And maybe here we come full circle back to that original question that we started with today. We are wise to reflect on the profound wisdom of Scripture and to be transformed in our character and in our relationship with God that ultimately leads us to Christ and participation in God's rule in the world. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. There's revival 
this time in the service, we come to an opportunity for prayer. And we recognize that there are a number of people today in our own congregation and in our community who are feeling frustrated, uncertain. How long will it take for us to get through this lockdown? What will the summer hold? We think of many graduates who are coming to the end of high school or the end of a university program, not sure what the fall holds for them. And so we want to be able to gather together today to lift up before God our concerns, knowing that we can trust him in all things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we give you thanks that we are your children and that you are our divine parent, that you love us like a mother, that you love us like a father, and that you want us to experience what it is to be a part of your family, a part of belonging and our identity centered in you. God, we thank you that as we discover faith in you through Jesus Christ, that we become a part of a story so much bigger than ourselves. God, we thank you for the churches that we are united with today, not only here in Nova Scotia, but around the world. We think today of our partners in India, who are there on the front lines responding through Canadian Baptist Ministries, helping those communities in Andhra Pradesh who have not had access to the COVID-19 vaccine. God, we pray for those churches as they respond to the health crisis in their communities. God, we thank you for the work going on in Uganda. We thank you for Reynold and Kathy Maines and the, the great work that's happening right now, Lord, in the Gulu City Park. God, we, we thank you for these images that were uh, sent to us this week of the progress of what's happening there in the park. And God, we give you praise for just how this project is coming together, how it's overcome so many hurdles, so much um, obstacles that have tried to slow down this work. And God, how you're opening new doors and giving the mains an opportunity to minister to young people and churches in their community. We pray that you will bless them. And then in a small way as a church that we would be able to continue to contribute to this construction project. God, we thank you that as a church, we are blessed with many opportunities. We thank you for the summer internship program that we're a part of. We pray, Lord, for the work that's going on now, putting in place all that's gonna be happening in the summer of 2021. God, we thank you for our province here in Nova Scotia. And we lift up to you our premier, Ian Rankin, our chief medical officer, Dr. Robert Strang. Here in Bridgewater, our mayor, David Mitchell. And the many public servants and doctors and frontline healthcare workers that are involved in the COVID testing and the vaccinations and caring for those who are in hospital. God, we pray for everyone right now who is experiencing COVID infection. We pray, Lord, that you would give them peace and protect them. We pray for those who are in ICU, those, Lord, who are needing critical care, those who are scared. God, we pray that you would surround them with your angels and that you give them peace and healing. Together, Lord, we pray for those in our own congregation who are going through issues of health and grief, for those who are recovering and those who are beginning medical treatment. And so God, we just lift up these names to you now. Lord, we pray for Carol Dagley, Tommy Boulevard, Paul Rand, Cameron Lowe, John Brady, Susan Bristow, Harold Langell, and Luke Sardi. God, in all things, we give you praise because we can trust you and you're working in our lives, ultimately, Lord, for your good. Lord, sometimes we, we are overwhelmed because we don't know how all the pieces fit together. But Lord, we trust you. We trust the moving of your Holy Spirit because, Lord, ultimately, you are bringing about what is good. We thank you, Lord, that you are able. For in Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. Spread of hell, oh the
Once again, I want to thank you for joining us for worship today at Bridgewater Baptist Church. We pray that you have a good week, and we look forward to being with you next Sunday as we celebrate together. Just one more reminder that for men in our church and community, we have our fellowship, our monthly men's gathering taking place this Thursday, which is May the 27th over Zoom. And you can find out more information by uh, sending a message to Aaron at BridgewaterBaptist.com. And now for a word of benediction, which comes from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen. <laughs>